When domain modeling, we're designing our components to represent the business's conceptual model so that we can reap the rewards of it being easier to understand, easier to read, and more easily maintained. We end up with objects that represent domain concepts. Ultimately, these objects have the job of working together to guard invariants, business rules, and update application state. An aggregate is a pattern from domain-driven design. Its typical meaning, a cohesive whole formed by combining separate elements, describes the pattern perfectly. It's these aggregations of domain objects working together to guard invariants that we're focused on in this episode. So let's talk about aggregates. Let's imagine that a customer places an order with us. We receive the request and raise an event that an order was placed. Events are things that have happened in the past. So when we see the order was placed event, we know that the order was placed. The event did happen. This is the complete workflow. The customer tries to place an order, we raise an event. Well, it's complete so long as we have no invariance to guard. So long as the business has no rules about what makes a valid order, then this is a complete approach. However, this isn't common. At the very least, orders must have a valid customer ID, they must include some kind of listing of what products are being ordered, etc. There are almost always invariants to be guarded. Now, it's possible to guard invariants in a number of ways. For example, imagine a function for placing an order. We'll call place order and the appropriate event is raised. Now let's one by one add invariants and improve this function so that it can guard them. First of all, we need to know that we have a valid order ID and customer ID. We can do that by changing our method signature. It only takes a change to our message signature because when designing the order ID and customer ID objects, we used our language's built-in capabilities to model consistency. We ensure that domain objects are not created unless they're immediately consistent with business rules. Then we can protect this function's correctness through type hints in the method signature. It's important to have a firm grasp on this concept while moving forward. Now, these invariants are guarded. What's next? Well, we can't have an empty product list. A valid order must contain at least one product, so let's guard that. Here, we simply have to add an if statement. If the product list is empty, we throw a specific exception that explains why. Throwing the exception here prevents the order was placed event from being raised, and it allows us to manage and react to the error from different layers in our application. So here we have our order ID, customer ID, and cart domain objects working together to make sure that we don't modify the application state inappropriately. So we can guard the invariants and raise the correct event. So far, so good. Now, how can we query our application state to make use of that? We want to be able to do stuff like this. So we need some kind of object to query, some object that has the necessary state and can give us an appropriate view of the state of our order. So we need some kind of object to query, some object that has the necessary state and can give us an appropriate view of the condition of our order. Now, our order was placed event is the first step in the life cycle of an order. So let's create an order object. The order object will hold the state for the order and give us a way to access it. When we apply the order was placed event to the order object, we have an object that represents an order using the domain language and our conceptual model of the domain. This order object is up to date with the status of the order. But what is application? Application is the process of applying state from the event. During this specific application, we're going to set the order ID field, set the customer ID field, add products to the object, and then set the current state of the order to placed. Now we can use this object to show the customer information about their order. Our order object represents the domain concept of an order. It can be identified. We can identify the customer that placed it. We know the products that are being ordered and we know the order status. Now, if we move our place order function into this object, then we have a domain object that works together with these other domain objects to guard invariants and update application state. We're modeling the concept of an order. Our order is an aggregate. We call it order because this object represents the state and behavior of an order. This isn't just naming, this is meaning. Now let's go ahead and implement the place order function as this object's constructor. Placing an order creates the order, so this concept is isomorphic or has the same shape as our business's idea of creating an order. The object represents the order, so creating an order is creating an object. Now let's take this one step further and create a named constructor. This way, we're expressing the lifecycle of the object in its interface in the publicly accessible methods. So we make the constructor private so that it can only be called from within an object of the same type. 
Then create a static method, a class method, that will call the constructor and raise the appropriate event. So now we have this order object. It's the place where we place an order, the place where the event is raised, and the place where the state is applied. The place where we raise the event and the place where we update the state fit our conceptual model of an order. This is the true nature of a domain model, our conceptual model informing the design of the form and function of our code implementation. All right, next invariant. Once an order is submitted, a customer can make payments until the order is complete. It may take many payments before the order is completed and sent off to the fulfillment department where the products will be shipped. In this case, we need to communicate with the object and tell it to make a payment. We'll create a method called pay that will accept a payment object. We'll add the payment object to the list of payments received in the order and raise the event payment was received. Now we want to check to see if the payment total matches up to the total cost of the order. If it does, we raise the event order was completed. As modeled, the order is an aggregate. It's a collection of domain objects working together. So this cloud of domain objects working together all represent a single concept. Now inside this concept is the implementation. The order consists of an order object, product objects, payment objects, an order ID and a customer ID. The order object alone isn't the aggregate. All of these working together as a conceptual whole is. However, the order object is at the top of the hierarchy. It has a special position in the aggregate. The order object is the aggregate root. Now, the aggregate root is essentially about being a memory address where the concept of an order exists in memory. Systems can interact with this address and send messages, and it'll be interacting with the idea of an order. Through this order object, we can uphold all of the invariants related to an order. The domain objects that are existing inside of that object, encapsulated inside, are the implementation details that do represent domain ideas, but aren't directly accessible from outside. So messages having to do with the order will be sent directly to this aggregate root. That object will then coordinate with any child objects in order to do its job. And finally, we raise the correct events and those are persisted. When we rebuild this aggregate, we're rebuilding the aggregate root. We interact with it through direct memory reference so that it can guard those invariants. If we could just interact with any objects within there, then we could modify the state of those objects, bypass the business rules, and create invalid state. The purpose of this aggregate root is to protect against that. Now, notice how we talk about the aggregate roots as representing a process. Think about an order. We make the order, we make payments, we complete the order. Everything we do with the order is part of an order life cycle. The interactions that update the state of the order all raise events, and these events themselves describe the life of that order. The order is a process. The aggregate is a modeled process. The aggregate root is the interface through which the rest of our code can interact with and understand the state of that process, the state of the order. This has deeply philosophical ramifications. We have this conceptual model of the solution space, which is derived from reality, filtered through human perception. We then turn it into code. The code is then a new model. It reflects the conceptual model, but removes any bits of it that aren't relevant to the use case. Added to that new model is the technical implementation details that are necessary to model the ideas in the language of our choosing. Finally, that source code is executed and a machine is instantiated. That machine is a new model. It represents the shape of the conceptual model as much as possible. So now we're looking at three different models, all based off of and reflecting the business's ideas about how to solve these problems. Each of these models resembles the original conceptual model, however, incorporates new ideas necessary to existing and operating at their layer of abstraction. It's important to note as well that aggregates represent transactional boundaries. Since the business rules are guarded by the aggregate, the way that we ensure that our persisted state is correct is to wrap the results of that interaction in a transaction. It's a single atomic update. So long as the entire state update is persisted, then we have guarded our invariants and the state of the system is uncompromised. So to summarize, an aggregate represents a domain object. It can consist of a single object, but is often made of multiple. An aggregate is a conceptual unit. Now, while it's built of one or more objects, 
it represents a single object. And when you think about the ideas that the business has about interacting with that object, understanding that the order might be placed or it might be fulfilled, understanding that we need to make payments, all of these interactions with that conceptual object are going to be the same interactions we implement in our domain model code. An aggregate is a business process, which manifests in code as a hierarchy of domain objects. Now that means that these objects could work together, but what ultimately they're doing is maintaining the business rules so that we can raise events that represent the life cycle of that aggregate. Anytime you have a sequence of events, that is representing a process. And when you think about an event source system, that's exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about nothing but sequences of events. So everything you make, instead of being modeled as a structure, is now modeled as a life cycle. An aggregate root is the object in which you interact with in order to ensure valid state change. You don't directly change the state of the children from outside of the aggregate root. You allow the aggregate root to be in control of all of that so that you can ensure valid state. And finally, an aggregate root is a transactional boundary. Any interaction you make with it represents an atomic update that is valid state. You don't have an interaction with an aggregate that represents a half updated state that requires interaction with a separate aggregate in order to ensure full application validity. Every aggregate in itself is responsible for making valid state updates. Then when you persist the events or you persist the state of the aggregate, you do so all as one atomic unit. If any fail, the entire thing fails. And in this way, you can ensure the validity of the persisted state.